Okay, um, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this latest promoters masterclass. This one's on venues and promoters. Um, it's part of the Association of Independent Promoters and Atom Promotion Series, um, assisted by Arts Council England. Um, so we have some amazing experts with us today. Um, we've got a quite a diverse audience as well. So we'll be covering things uh, from basics to, to more complex stuff. Um, you can ask questions. Um, you can, you all know Zoom by this point. Um, you can write them in, I'll, I'll ask them at the end. Um, hopefully we won't have any technical glitches. If we do, please just bear with us and we'll try and get everything back on track. Um, so with us today, we have John Dunn from Parallel Lines. John, you are hiding out in Brixton Academy, I believe, today. Um, post post jungle. Uh, we've got Brian Reynolds from Four Three Two Presents, who is in. Well, why don't you tell us where you are, Brian? I'm in my motorhome outside the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester. He doesn't have his own personal tour bus, sadly. <laughs> um, and we have Laura Davidson from Amigas. Where are you, Laura? Just so we've got the full picture. Uh, I'm just at home. I know as exotic as yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> So I thought we should start by each of you maybe telling us how you got into this industry um, and how you ended up where you are now, just briefly, so everyone has a sort of context for for later answers. Um, Laura, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I went to music college after school in Brighton and... I was meant to be going to University of Manchester and started sort of putting on mates bands just for fun um, and then sort of got the bug and decided actually I'd sort of sack off going to university and just get into it by you know learning on the job so yeah just sort of managed to blag alone and started putting on um, a few more better known bands in Brighton um, and promoted in Brighton for years until I basically ran out of money but in that time frame I was also starting to manage a band um, called the Maccabees, who I ended up sort of working with and managing, taking to a management company down in Brighton and worked with them for five years, saw them signing to the first um, deal. Um, and then sort of a few years in, I realised that actually management wasn't necessarily my forte, um, just working with sort of one act. I wanted to work with, with more acts than, than that. So I moved, um, I emailed all of the Maccabees promoters and actually Metropolis Music came back to me and offered me a job. So I went in there as a national promoter um, and worked there for a bit and built a roster, um, including like Wolf Alice and Alt-J and Disclosure and um, Sam Smith and Ellie Golding and um, eventually went over to AG and launched Golden Voice, which is a uh, sort of Californian promoter, um, but brought the brand over to to the UK and sort of took all my artists with me and developed Golden Voice. Um, ended up while I was there, uh, we won the tender for Victoria Park. So we did the festivals there and launched All Points East. And I did that for two years until recently when I left and I've just started my own thing um, called Amigas, which is um, sort of a consultancy. So I want to do a bit of everything that I've done in the past and work with other like-minded people. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Brian. Maybe you could go next. Yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, I started pretty young. I was uh, I was on I was on the dole. I finished uni. My band, my friend, my best friend's band started becoming amazing, and the uh, I, their manager wasn't very good. Then I ended up starting to help them, and then I became the manager, and then. I started organizing little concerts just basically for them and a few other bands like Max Tundra and the Monsoon Bassoon and so a few London folks. And the, uh, then I started up a, a club night called Death Kill 4000. It was kind of like an obnoxious electro clash sort of a uh, um, punk night. And the, uh, the, that night became like quite popular enough that it, enough that a few people noticed it. One of those people was John Mack, the, who's now the Redden and Leeds booker. And he, him and Martin Bimrose asked me to come in to come in to help at the bar, the bar fly. I became like assistant booker. And then a few weeks later, I was, I was the main booker for the venue. I was there for four and a half years. I became the regional promoter manager. I was managing like 
Aberdeen, Cardiff, uh, Birmingham, and Glasgow. And the uh, I then was made redundant from the Barfly Group, and basically three people just all rotated company <laughs> with, uh, and everyone got pay rise. Uh, we, and I ended up at the Arches uh, in Glasgow, which was a big, big nightclub big multi-arts venue, theatre place, a really great place to cut my teeth from a production point of view and I was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into having a much uh, stronger production ability, like a much more varied skill set and the uh, then if, if I left to try to start my own venue, the venture completely failed, I was in utter crisis and the uh, I then just woke up one day, I woke up the next day after I'd had a major crisis, after my plans had went to, went very badly on the opening a venue front and the, uh, I just continued booking shows. I didn't really, have, I, I hadn't really done anything else for 12 years. So that was, that was what I, that was what I did. And I just, just got fired in the, uh, a couple of years later, I opened the Hug and Pine and now we, well, now we have, I think today's count or yesterday's count was 329 concerts on sale. We promote Angel Olsen, Mac DeMarco, Black Midi, Mitski, uh, loads of amazing talent. We're the UK promoters for Dr. Hook. We organize a national whiskey festival, booked in the rabbit hole and a whole bunch of different festival things. And I employ about 40 people. The uh, Yeah, it's been kind of, uh, it's been quite a, quite, a, quite a crazy ride from this past seven years. That is great, thank you. And John? Um, I started, mine might be a bit longer because I'm so old, but my, my <laughs> I started in Chelmsford in Essex in 1990 and uh, I was in a band but I was pretty hopeless and um, I figured that if I put some shows on I'd meet more people and I'd get more friends and I could get drunk every night and watch bands and make a bit of money. And uh, I'm kind of still wondering if that's going to happen. But, but um, that was in Chelmsford. And uh, for the first five, six years, I pretty much did 200, 300 capacity rooms um, around Essex. I then went in-house at Colchester Arts Centre, um, 400 capacity church, and started to book comedy, folk, theatre, blues. Started to learn about kind of cross demographics and things like that. I then moved up to Northampton Road Mender, which is a new opening, new build with the Millennium Money, um, which is a thousand capacity room. And um, again, booked across theatre, dance, music. And in 2002, I left there to form my own company and started doing shows around the country and thinking I was going to be a national promoter on my own. And I uh, got the call from Clear Channel to come to London and Clear Channel um, hired me. So they then became Live Nation. And uh, my role was to become a national promoter with the Live Nation. And started Latitude Festival at the very same time, Live Nation had brought into Festival Republic. So I ran that for eight years and booked shows nationally um, with various things at RK Fire, Anthony Johnson's, MIA, The National, blah, blah, blah. And then in 2013, I decided to leave the corporate structure um, I really wanted my summers back, the festivals, doing touring bands all year long and then doing the festivals in the summer meant that my summers were dead and I was doing Electric Picnic and Latitude, which meant I had two festivals across the whole summer. And I wanted to be back into independent world, so I formed Parallel Lines with my wife. Excellent, thank you. Um, so between the three of you, we've pretty much got all the experience we could possibly imagine in this industry. Um, perhaps before we go on, just because there will be some people who are at the very start of this. Could we explain the difference between different kinds of promoters? Because we've got external promoters, we've got in-house promoters, well, so we've got external programmers, festival promoters. How distinct are those roles and, and what skill sets do they require that, that are different, do you think? Any of you can answer that. Um, I, think, I think with an in-house promoter, um, it, it can depend what city you're in. If you're in a you know, larger city, uh, smaller city, that can change a little bit. But you're looking for a balanced program. You're looking to hit all types of demographics on particular nights of the week. Obviously, you're looking for your building to be open, uh, a club night to maximize some income, um, and just making the whole thing balanced across um, all the genres, really, to maximize those, that, 
that that population or that that kind of base and within your town and what about the other roles the external programmer for example what 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 are they doing that's different a, an external programmer is i think i understand this correctly is just a promoter who is not tied to a singular venue and they just program wherever it feels like the best place for the act to play which okay which gives a lot more freedom to the role uh, and the festival sorry sorry go on perhaps less uh, security mm -hmm. and for the festival program because it's... Look, how distinct is that Um, I think I think for the festival programmer, it's um, it's it's all year. It never used to be an all all year job, but you know mm -hmm. there was always that kind of. I remember you know working with Reading Leeds, and back in the day it would finish in August, and then they'd start thinking about it in October, and uh, or even November, you know, in terms of like programming. But I think obviously with more festivals and the com competition and the amount of acts, etc. And the planning, everyone's planning so much more in advance. That is now an all-year job. You know, you're looking at your headliners for maybe next year and the year after. Um, so I, I think there's when I book festivals and I don't anymore, there was always this myth that you kind of you just kind of swanned in and just done a little bit each day, and then like the three weeks before the festival, it was quite busy. But it's it's really it really is a, a full-time job, and it's a lot of a lot of saying no rather than saying yes. I think. Yeah, we will come to say no in a little bit, but um, all of you have started or done regional work. Um, what's the relationship between a region or a sort of local programmer and a national? And, and how does that relationship develop? Because a lot of people, I think, will start local, won't they? Yeah, I think you sort of cut your teeth by promoting. Uh, most promoters come from having promoted in a city and then sort of end up somehow in a national promoter. Um, so most national promoters have an understanding of how important, you know, regional and local promoters are, I think. Uh, we, not many, well, I'd like to think most of them do. Um, and I think so in that, in that case, you know, there's so much that a local promoter who's on the ground who knows where to put the posters and everything, you know, that is a very important role because the National's probably based in an office in, in London or Manchester and, you know, hasn't got the network of, of places to know where to put the tickets in the record shops and just things like that. So, um, yeah, there's, I think there's definitely a, a role for both. Unfortunately, what often happens is, you know, a local promoter will put on the first shows for an act and get them to a level and then a National, a less sensitive na na National promoter might just swan in and and start promoting the whole country and so you know the local promoters actually built that act up in that territory and just as they start making money it's gone yeah and yeah. that's i think where the struggle is and i think if like anything if you're if you are based in if you're based in the area and you're an expert in that area and you have a lot of experience and you understand the nuance the nuances of the venues and the audiences then you're positioned to do the best job for the artist i mean the like the job of the promoter is to make things easier is to add value and if you're not an expert in the market that you're in i know i'm sitting outside manchester with uh, dr ukraine and uh, there are promoters that uh, have far like have got incredibly superior knowledge to me about the Manchester market, but it's like if something goes wrong and you're uh, if something goes wrong and you need to react, it's the guys on the ground that can actually react, the uh, and fix it quickly, the uh, and also it's like a few a few percentage points additional in, in sales makes a makes a really big difference to how successful a show is because the margins are always tight, you know. Laura, when you were in Brighton um, and you were starting out and you were doing local promotion, um, how did you then make your case to to a national? 
company that that you were valuable how do you how do you make that um I think I just spotted that a lot of the shows of the acts that I really wanted to go to um you know I was working in a record shop down in Brighton at the time as well so I had the list of every gig that was going on in the in the town so I'd know if like Neon Neon or one of these bands were playing and I'd see that you know who was promoting it and then notice that there weren't actually any flyers or posters around town I mean I'd be out with for my own gigs I'd be standing outside every club night and there was an indie club night every night of the week in Brighton at the time and it was that sort of that real moment so you know I was like well why can't I just give out some live net clear channel post flyers at the same time or just see where you can add value in terms of the relationships that you've got and notice if there was a show happening that didn't have record like tickets in the record shop or where you know the record shops down there are very important in terms of selling tickets and where people go to find out what's going on so I think just sort of identifying where you're strong and then sort of just lagging like getting in touch I, you know I don't know how I had the contact but I think yeah at one point I was you know not getting paid much maybe 100 quid to give out some posters and flyers but they'd send them down to you and then it's it's every little counts it's better than a day's shift in a pub or a week's shift in a pub <laughs> so that's what it was otherwise so yeah just finding little ways that you can do what you want to do and what you do well those like. relationships um did they then flourish later on in your career the little um, partnerships you made that one in particular, no, um, uh, but I did try, I, I contacted them when I wanted to move up to London and become a national promoter, but they'd just filled a role for a new, new booker, so um, it didn't, I didn't go into Clear Channel, which ended up being Live Nations, so that's why I went into Metropolis, because I had a stronger relationship with them because of the Maccabees, which sort of came between the two, two things, basically. How, how important have those kinds of, have relationships like that even if you didn't weren't able to sort of convert that one into something later on how important they are they early on in, in a career and and having maybe sort of a mentorship role for you yeah I mean mentorship without sort of being labeled a mentor it's I think it's so important I mean John's been a, a really important mentor to me in the past and um, I met him actually I think he contacted me about promoting some shows for the Maccabees or something and then maybe we're talking about bits and bobs in Brighton so that's how we met and then there's been other other amazing mentors that are people that helped me out when I was a you know 18 year old promoter in Brighton um, that I still work with and that now we have a really solid there's a um, Natasha who's just launched Mother Artist, who's Idol's agent. You know, we went to college together and then she sort of became an agent and gave me a lot of her acts like Block Party and um, Mystery Jets and a lot of the acts that she was working with when she was at 13 Artists, which is a Brighton-based agency. So I think the thing about the promoter role um, is it is a relationship business, especially and people want, you know, you've, by building and doing a good job and constant, people will just trust you and keep coming back to you, but also having a mentor that has done it before that you can be like, I don't know what I'm doing because you're constantly learning. <laughs> I mean, I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm constantly having to ask people, what, you know, who have done it before me, what, how they've done it. So, yeah, there's a sort of two-pronged thing, I think, but relationships are, are hugely valuable and important to our jobs, I think. How do you build that initial relationship with a venue? Any oh, yeah. <laughs> it, most, most, most venues are actually uh, like it's a service industry, so most venues are delighted to have you. The uh, but I suppose you need like any relationship, you just need to focus on establishing trust, you know, and that's uh, sometimes the venue will be wary of the promoter or perhaps promoters in general or whatever, but. I often think the, if you if you feel like there's an issue with the uh, if you feel like the relationship isn't really working properly, one of the easiest ways to fix it is just to invite the appropriate person out for lunch or dinner and see if you can uh, establish some rapport. You know, it's like the sometimes that sometimes that just completely changes everything. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think also, I mean, that establishment is to trust and it is to you know, doing shows and, and, you know, making sure the shows run well, but also for a lot of venue owners, um, it, it is about bar tape. And then if you're going to put 200 people into a 200 capacity room and they're going to drink, then that's one step towards you doing regular shows there, definitely. 
yeah. how do you how do you show then that you understand that venue as a brand and what's unique to that to that venue um I, I think you can you can always go the other way i mean there's there's a venue in london chats palace which wasn't used really for shows and you know a number of promoters including myself started started to do shows there um so you can always like brand the venue almost if you go back the other way if they haven't had shows before you should you should always try try to a certain extent to defy expectations even within a brand's even within like what the venue is you know like there's if, if somewhere like I, I like promoting a mono in Glasgow it's an, an amazing place it's like super DIY sort of spot and it's got one it's got the best records record store in Scotland in there run by Stephen Pastel and Depp uh, and the it's just like it's an amazing place a vital part of the vital part of the community they only do two gigs two gigs a week but I like putting in different things in there instead of just focusing on indie all the time sometimes i just put on like sometimes i put on heritage stuff like i've got errol slick who was david bowie's guitar player in there and you just like it's worthwhile when once people start to expect a business or a individual to behave in a certain way then those behaviors can be uh boring <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to try to it's good to try to mess with that, you know. I know that we we all spoke last week about um about this event, but we were talking about how you program throughout a year and how you um you have to ensure and you have to understand early on that you can't just program the music that you love and you can't just program guitar but in a small town, for example, you can't just program guitar bands every night of the week. How do you go about learning what works? How do you take those risks? Who are you having conversations with? Or are you reading about it or listening to things? Um, I think you learn, I mean, personally, I learned the hard way trying to put on five nights of bands in Chelsea who were in the NME. It was, I was just doing the same 20 people every night and just losing every single night, but then making the same 20 friends, I would say. But it's like, you, I think you just have to, you, you know, you have to be open to learning about other music. And I think that's, I think that's very different now in terms of those demographics are much more kind of blurred anyway. But it just, I think, shaping your shaping your venue and understanding, shaping your booking, but also understanding that the venue maybe can't do, you know, an indie night every night because it's going to be it's going to be full of a certain demographic. And maybe if you've got a blues band in where there's people thirty five to fifty and they're all drinking as well, then then that's a balance for them as well. So I think it's learning, it's learning, being a bit more open to other other genres. Maybe genres that you, you're not really particularly, you know, uh, interested in. Maybe, but just having a, a big, a bigger outlook. And what about the shape of a year? Because that can. Sorry, Brian, were you about to say something? So, yeah, often, often that process when you expose yourself to music that you're not interested in, you develop the interest in it, and it's uh, it's very, very rarely an unhealthy process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the shape of the year and the location and the community and very sort of variation in population i guess can can hugely affect how you program throughout a year can't it um laurie you're in brighton obviously a big student town for a long time so i'm guessing summers and winters looked a bit different yeah i mean i learned the hard way as well because i um I just thought, you know, I'd had a successful, you know, spring period, my first kind of spring period and every show sold out and it was great. And then I booked a band that I loved in July and, you know, paid them what was quite a lot of money at the time and really struggled with ticket sales and wiped out everything that I'd made in my successful you know, sit first like early season all went on one show in the summer because everyone's gone on holiday and the students aren't around. And, you know, I'm sure had I known that, you know, there's other things that you can put on in the summer that people are around and want to go to. But um, yeah, for me, I was putting on bands that I loved and um, I just didn't realise that people wouldn't be around to buy tickets. I just thought if everyone, if I loved them, everyone else would love them and be around as well. So um, yeah, I guess it's about, I mean, people who have worked in a, sort of more on the venue side of things will probably know how to fill those gaps in terms of making sure that the summers are selling tickets, um, which they, Brian or John might be able to be better at. Yeah, Brian, you, yeah. You, you've diversified, you've 
you've turned didn't you turn a very quiet period into one of your most successful periods that's right yeah the uh we i think like nowadays the a lot of a lot of like circuit venues are very very busy their calendars are packed meaning that even the small places like like uh like our place the hug and paint uh it's very difficult to get avails you know if you were asking for a friday or saturday avail at the hug and paint it's very difficult to get one before november 22 you know it's like and this is a 100 cap venue it shows you how much things have changed the uh and that means that those those de- those little periods for local for local act th- these those little periods where you would have been quiet actually it can be quite rich territory for getting out and developing local acts and i think like it's worth getting out there and cutting a really, really supportive deal and establishing those relationships with with uh, young bands very quickly. We don't we don't try to make money from promoting local talent. You know, it's like a, it's like there's a community focus on our talent development program. You know, it's like the, the Hug and Paint is there to develop talent and the. Uh, so cut, making sure that we've got the best deal in town for the local acts is like is important to us, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, and it's uh, but it's basically turned the folk offering the best deal in town, making an effort with it, branding the whole thing up, and then creating that strong brand the band the brand builds year on year it basically doing that in the hug has basically turned out the our quiet periods into our busiest periods our quietest periods into our busiest periods which is pretty which is pretty remarkable you know and if you can get rid of the quiet periods on a venue calendar that's how to make it successful because it's the quiet periods that always kill you you know absolutely um we're in a very strange moment right now because we're just returning to to live music and there have been some strange patterns of sales have been who knows what's going to happen has that altered how how it all works for you guys john you're obviously sitting on a very successful jungle tour um do you have any idea whether covid and the the emergence therefrom is is going to change how things are booked or how how the year looks um i don't actually i mean it's it's quite tricky and uh, it's a bit of a surprise i We've just come back and we're doing our first shows and back at Brixton Academy here with Jungle and we've done four nights and they've sold very, very well. And um, some of that, a degree of that may be due to the timing. We're six weeks after um, Freedom Day and, um, and you know, we're out of August and the, and the summer and Jungle are a very upbeat band. And so there is that kind of feeling of partying and that, but I don't know. We're seeing we're seeing drop offs on shows where lots of no shows. I, I kind of think, but I hope I, I think that that kind of no show thing will just get back to how it was. I would think we're booking. I think one thing which has definitely changed is when we started to all reschedule shows, and then we just you know at first it was like wow we're rescheduling shows, and then every day it was just we're rescheduling another show. Mm-hmm. But when we got to that kind of pattern. We then got into a situation where we were putting some shows on sale as well. And we're putting shows on sale a year, 18 months ahead of where we ever would. And there was always this kind of weird kind of rule that you would almost, if you had a big show in, in February or March, you'd put it on sale in early September. And, and that's kind of gone out the window. It's almost like we'll just get the show on sale, regardless of, there may not be a record, the record may, may be late, whatever just let's get the show on sale. And I think that's been one of the changing patterns. And we, I'll give you an example. We've gone up with a Future Island show at Alexander Palace, which is 10,000 capacity. Uh, we wouldn't have probably announced it until a couple of weeks' time. It's next March. We just got the thing on sale during mm-hmm. the pandemic, just get it up there and let it sell. We're at 6,000 tickets. And so that whole model of, of waiting to schedule a show on sale, I think, I think that's changed with the pandemic. And I don't think it will go back. I think we've also, the fact we've had to reschedule so many shows, now the diaries, uh, it's much harder to get a diary in you know, a year's time, a year and a half's time. So I think that's, that's the major change, I think, from my end. Has the relationship between promoters and venues and agents changed substantially during this time as well? I, th- I think that 
there is perhaps perhaps more respect for our colleagues within the industry. There is more mutual respect because I think everyone realizes how difficult it's been, how va how varied all of our difficulties have been, and how resilient our colleagues have had to be in order to face down this past eighteen months. Uh, some serious, seriously tough moments, you know, where like on several occasions I was like, oh my god, I'm going to need to make everyone redundant. This whole thing is absolutely, absolutely gone. It's over. The uh, where the yeah, but I have noticed this past week that all of the uh, all of the usual, all of the old weirdness has come back. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I always like to say that a problem well expressed is half solved, and the uh, I've been getting some very poorly expressed problems this past week. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot rests on that on that relationship between promoters and agents, really, doesn't it? How do you develop that? I mean, we've talked about establishing trust with with venue owners. Is it very different with agents, or how do you? What are the tricks to that? Again, any of you? Yeah, I guess it's different whether you're a venue or a promoter. I mean, I've got to the point where I've realised the agents who I like working with, and I'm happy to just work with them and maybe find some new ones, but not force relationships which are tricky. Um, when you're a promoter or a festival or a venue or a festival. You can't really be choosy as to what agents you work with because you know you need to fill your diary or you need to book the best bill. Um, so that's kind of the difference. I mean, as a maybe it's a bit defeatist, but as a promoter, going back to it now, I kind of I know the ones who I like working with and the people who I respect and vice versa, and that's kind of good enough for me to be honest. Um, because there are times when others have made life very difficult and there's obviously a lack of respect both ways so there's not you know there's not really much point in working together if you're going to constantly be put under pressure and which ends up you losing money um most of the time because there is a lack of respect so I think it's good to be able to say no and have a bit of a, a sort of solid line on who's who you work with and who you don't as a promoter or as, as a venue you kind of just have to be good with everyone and hopefully you'll have promoters that have relationships with everyone that can bring in the content what's the heart of those relationships that are, sorry brian did you want to i i kind of think that the uh i thought i thought that was those points were excellent laura that's a good way for a balanced uh, balanced approach to life and i think forcing it is really really difficult the uh it doesn't end well usually and the uh but yeah i've i've found that if you grow with the agent if you grow up with the agent if you it's like the, it's similar to developing the talent you know it's like the you invest in that person you try and support them you try and grow with them you try and develop them and you if you're supportive of people when they when they don't have massive acts to offer then mm. they will remember that you know mm. Uh, if, you, if you're if you're nice be nice to the interns you know like, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Matt, Matt Copley was an was an intern at uh, the agency I believe oh, really? like some only eight years ago you know John John what were you gonna say it's yeah it's exactly that Brian in terms of you know you you are kind of like growing up with some of these people as well and I think I think it's it's it's, it's quite basic to, to a degree. It's just, you know, you follow through with what you do and um, you learn the politics of, of not going to the manager, not maybe speaking directly to a band. And, uh, and I think in time, the agent starts to kind of trust you. And as long as you just keep doing a good job and, um, and you know, selling shows and, and making sure everything runs smoothly, I think, I think you, can, you, build, you build that trust that way. I also think... I've noticed that if you very often for promoters or for agents, your first big act is the one you kind of remember. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed a, a real kind of a, a recurring trend is that if you, if you invest in a, a young agent who's just come into the business, take their first few bands, um, then if you then get their, their first big band and that band explodes for that agent, you somehow build this bond which which can never be broken. It was always their first big band and you were the promoter. 
Mm -hmm. And I just, I've noticed it along the lines that somehow you're, you're in a different position to every other promoter. You were there for their first one. Do you notice that as well, Laura and Brian? Definitely, yeah. And also, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, um, and that, that sort of defines you almost as your, that first act almost defines you as a promoter. And, and then sort of that relationship you sort of develops out because people are looking at the team around it and being like, oh, you were on that act that then broke that and got to like three Brixtons in their first tour. And it's, um, yeah, it is, and you've got to give everyone the time of day when they're sort of starting out, I think is really important. I mean, I was given good advice when I became a national promoter because it was a complete shift from being a local promoter. Um, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing and an agent, you know, I kept on chasing the big agents going, oh, I really love your new act. You know, it's a lot of it is like scouting and going to the old blue last every night. And, and you know, if it's a big agent, they've got their relationships, you know, they've got their people that they've come up the ranks with that they're generally always going to give that hot new act to, or, you know, there's, there's a sort of thing in that. Whereas actually, if you look at the other age, your contemporaries and you sort of start going to gigs with them and rather than wasting your time approaching agents that are kind of not really that interested in talking to you because you're no one um actually sort of finding your your contemporaries and working with them and going to their gigs and just helping each other out and then you sort of grow together is was quite a big advice it takes i did a bit of an intern in a metropolis laura mm -hmm. and um, i remember in the office one day this must have been about 1994 and paul hutton was talking about this 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 ginger guy from Ireland who'd just become an agent and how they would do a couple of bands with him. And that was Steve Strange. And so <laughs> yeah. he didn't do so bad, did he? But, doing all right. Yeah. yeah. But it was just exactly, you know, they were doing that, investing in, in the new young agents and kind yeah. of supporting them because you'll get payback if they do well. Those relationships can take time though, can't they, to establish? And, and, and meanwhile, you aren't necessarily prospering, I guess, as, as promoters, are you? I mean, all of you juggled some, some interesting um, other jobs alongside <laughs> promoting in the early days. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. You're laughing, Brian. There's a reason for that. Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about my old jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Legal reasons, ladies and gentlemen. Um... <laughs> I could talk, I'll talk about some of the legit ones. I've been a karaoke presenter, a labourer. Uh, <laughs> what else have I done? Call centre work. Uh, I've forgotten the other ones. <laughs> but all the time that you are doing those those other jobs, I guess you're presenting yourself to agents, to venues, to bands, to whoever as as someone who has everything under control, hmm. who isn't losing money, who isn't panicking about the bar sales, how do you how do you maintain that image? And what are the important points for that? I've been I've been fortunate enough not to like I I, I did need to do that when I was like twenty to twenty two mm -hmm. or something like that, and I did it like a maniac in a very madcap and uncontrolled style and the way that like only young people can do and the uh the i wouldn't recommend that but the, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long long time that way and you make lots of mistakes so the uh yeah i think just being just being straight with people you know it's mm -hmm. like more i i find that like we've come out of a we've come out of a time where quite a negative time where a lot of people there's been like the negativity in people's minds has been at the front of the agenda a lot of the time you know but my, i mean my experience working with other people is that like i mean i i love working with other people when i see my colleagues being successful i am truly delighted for them and i, I love to i love to see that and i think like if you can focus on the joy that you get mm if you can fo if you can work out where you get the joy from and if you can take if you can take energy from the joy of other people then then people respond to that and they can uh, that can help you a lot successfully a lot professionally yeah uh laura you and were 
when you were starting out, you had a rather interesting way of, of financing your early promotion work, didn't you? Well, I'd kind of got to a point where I was beginning to run out of money and I'd, um, I'd built quite a good relationship with 13 artists down in Brighton at the time and they had sort of all these amazing acts coming out and um, I was putting on the Arctic Monkeys first show in Brighton and I didn't realise quite how hot they were um, but yeah it sold up really quickly but still I'd had to pay the deposit before I could get the pick up the money from the um, from the ticket shop because all the money was in the ticket in the record shop at the time in tickets um, and at that time luckily my friends I was well, no, all my friends were at university I wasn't I was you know doing this and various other things but um, so I was using their student loan to pay deposits for for artists just at the bank because the bank rolling you know and it's very hand to mouth in terms of obviously the agent never knows probably still still to this day I still work with them but um yeah there's just you just have to find the one thing you do is you pay deposits and you pay the artist and you mm -hmm. you know always make sure they've got the rider they want and so there was no way I was going to let that down but so yeah you just have to find find ways to do it um and so yeah, we, we called it the friendly bank. A lot of my friends' names helped bank well <laughs> the early days of my business when I was down there. Yeah. I, I I remember the another job I had the the uh, it was I had it for about six years. I was the match day announcer and DJ for Hamilton Academical FC. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. Are you still not still do it now? Brian. No, I, had, like, I wouldn't give that. I had to quit because I just I was I remember I remember when I phoned up Martin from Churches and asked them to do it for me. I was like, this is this is beyond a joke. I'm like I'm desperate. I'm constantly desperate for people to do it. But when I became independent, I remember that paid thirty quid uh, each match day, which of the which there are like twenty in a year. And I remember my wife saying to me, "That's a nice wee earner for you now." <laughs> I was like, I am not that fucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to be blunt, what are the ways to make money? What are the and what are the ways to lose money in your industry? Um, John. There's um many ways to lose money. <laughs> Suspicion there might be. <laughs> I think um in terms of the, you know the deal's gotta be right, of course. Mm -hmm. And if you're a new promoter, you're going to go through a period of time. I, I, when I started, I never worked with any local bands. I got, I would, I, my first shows were with agents. So straight away, I was, I didn't realize it, but I was being screwed for money all the time. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the deals have to be right. But if you're going to an agent, you've probably got to prepare yourself to pay a little bit over the odds. But then you maybe don't know what over the odds is. Find yourself a promoter who's 30 miles away, 40 miles away, who doesn't, is no competition with you, build a relationship, you can talk on, you talk about what deals you're doing, what tours are happening. That's vital. That, that saved me in the early years talking to lots of Connell Dodds and people like that back in the early 90s. But, but I always think that, I always think that, you know, once the deal is done, you, you have to maximize your income. So of course you have to sell tickets, but then you have to minimize minimize what your what your um, what your costs are so straight away once that offer's gone I would tend to be working on what do, you know I need a door person but I need a security can I can I do can the venues provide one security if we do x amount of money across the, the um, across the bar or whatever um, can the door person um, maybe come in a bit earlier and help with the catering or something can it can you cook a vegetarian chili on a Wednesday? And then it will still work on a Thursday. So you. Mm. <laughs> These are some really good tips. Huh? These are some great tips. Oh, great. The, the vegetarian chili, some days would go for like four or five days. <laughs> <laughs> we'll post the recipe in the chat box for you oh, later. Man, you know, those kidney beans. <laughs> but, but I think you're looking at your, you're maximizing your income, selling the tickets, and minimizing every cost. How can you get it cheaper without actually, obviously, ripping people off or mm. in the piss? Um, but but you're creating that that balance and that gateway for more finance to come come in. What about sponsorship? Does it, does that play a role ever? 
Not personally for me. I've, I've never done so much uh, sponsorship. It's a big thing. It's a big thing actually in Europe. Um, I live in Barcelona, and a lot of the events there are promoted by Estrella, the, the beer company, and um, it works differently. But and I know obviously festivals and stuff. But I, in terms of um, promoting um, singular shows, I've never come across it so much. I don't know if the other guys have. I'm the same actually, but it is a is possibly an idea that a bunch of promoters should get together and employ a sponsorship person to <laughs> to start bringing in some uh, some business uh, because it's, it's some I think it's something that that it's like you don't get fruit from it very often, and you're better off spending your time just focusing on the shows. But the thing those deals can be uh, can be hugely beneficial, and you see them. You can see, like with Live Nation and AEG, they get significant revenues from sponsorship. You know, the uh, the yeah, I, th I think I think John's points were amazing there. I love the uh, negotiation, like negotiating secu free security based on bar targets is a really excellent point point for negotiation. And the uh, I think like respect that how you lose money. Is by not by not trying to identify probability by not doing your calculations based on probability by saying yes because you want the show rather than saying yes because you think the probability is that the show will not lose money <laughs> the uh, the and then being very diligent and always negotiating with your costs, you know? People don't like, people get upset when you constantly negotiate costs with them. The venues don't like it, of course they don't, but it is, uh, they do respect that that is your job most of the time. Um, we're drawing close to sort of question time. So people please do, in the audience, please do raise questions, but we can carry on chatting regardless. But um, perhaps as we're getting to that sort of time, you could tell us, each tell us your, uh, well, first of all, tell us your big successes. Where you really felt you pulled a rabbit out of the hat. Laura, what was one for you? Oh, God. Um, it's hard because you sort of have successes, little, you know, little successes all along the way. So what would probably be deemed success is, you know, selling out arena shows and stuff. But actually, you know, it's probably the most amazing moments have actually been you know, some of those first moments of finding an app that then you promote from the 100 capacity up to 500 capacity or getting that call from the agent who, um, you know, as, as a brand new promoter saying, do you want to promote one of your favourite apps was huge. I remember getting a call from Charlie Meyer at 13 Artists. Again, I'd been doing a lot of their sort of new bands and stuff and he called me up and he was like, do you want to promote Supergrass? And to me, at that, that time, I was just like, oh, my God, I was literally like skipping down the lanes on the phone trying to keep my cool. <laughs> but just those little things when you're just starting out are so amazing. And I mean, obviously, like I didn't promote the shows, but seeing the Maccabees do their final shows at Ali Pali was amazing because, you know, I'd put them on as such a raggle taggle indie band. And you know, I've, I've found them by putting them on supporting Maximo Park at the free bar and then sort of started helping them out and then ended up working with them for five years. And obviously when it, I, I went a separate ways, but they've always, you know, we've always remained very close and seeing them sell out three Alexander Palaces was just amazing. And just having like, you know, the still the same crew of us from Brighton, but then 30,000 more. <laughs> it was like, it was amazing seeing that as well. But yeah, it's, um, and the, the first year of All Points East, was, it's always been a dream of mine to book a festival. And I, it was pretty much my dream lineup, which we managed to sort of pull off. So <laughs> downhill from then, basically. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. You could retire after that one. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, those are probably the, it's hard, it's hard to pinpoint one success. They are excellent ones. Um, what about you, John? Um, I don't know, I kind of, I kind of constantly have this kind of argument in my head, what is, you know, what is success? Where is the finish line? And I think a lot of promoters feel that. It's like, where are we striving for? We kind of get into this stuff and mm. don't really know where it's going to end. So I think you almost have to pinpoint what is, what it, what is success first? And for me, it's like 
the general feeling is success is that everyone wants to be a huge promoter and do huge shows. Well, that's not necessarily the, you know, the, 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 the marker. The marker may be that you work in a, in a field of music, maybe ambient music, and you're so passionate about ambient music and you can get it to, you can get it to some of the masses or that, that would be success. Or you want to be rich. You can, you know, the two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. You can be a rich promoter and without doing big shows. So you can, you can be a kind of, you know, you can do it that way too. So I think you have to define where the success is. For me personally, like, I, I think, I think just getting through, I think just actually doing the cleaning jobs and, and just getting through and just, learning on the job and getting through those first three or four years when all your friends around you are kind of going out and uh, they now don't come to your gigs anymore because they've outgrown them and um and you don't have the money to go out and i think just for me personally just getting through those early years is a success i mean specific things probably would be latitude was a big success in terms of the first festival that i booked and it was we, we did okay and I guess from a band point of view, Arcade Fire was kind of game changing for me in terms because because they were just so big. It was just mm. so big. You know, I, did, I was talking to someone the other day, and they they really could have done a Brixton on the Brixton Academy on their first London show yeah. on their first London show. So that was a game changer in terms of um, uh, for me personally. And Brian. Yeah, I've had, I've had a few amazing moments, and it's not it's not about making the most money on a single show or anything. Some of the something like I named my venue after the Arab Strap album Monday at the Hug and Paint, and the uh, the I funnily enough when funnily enough the day I done a deal to take on a venue, I bumped into Aidan and Nice and Sleazies and asked if he would if asked if it would be cool if I called the venue by that name. And he was like, "Of course it is. Let's have a drink." The, uh, the then he designed the logo, and then years later, I was asked to promote the Arab Strap gigs, and that's like a real uh, real honor, you know. The uh, some other th some other things like then taking bands like Big Thief from. Like Big Be Thief have just worked so hard, you know. They've really worked their asses off. They're the hardest working band in rock, mm -hmm. and they're, uh, they've played every they've played everywhere all the time. They play in Scotland every five months, so I've had like breakfast and lunch and dinner with them all over the place. And the uh, they're really lovely people, and the sticks exceptional. The uh, so taking them from the from the hug and paint bouncing between Glasgow, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and now to be at the Barrowlands with amazing sales and then being a huge, huge, huge act. The Barrowlands is such a romantic venue for, for Scottish people, you know, the, uh, that's amazing. And taking down the, ra like working very closely with doing the rabbit hole and taking it from being a festival that was like, seemed like a bunch of acid casualties who started a festival in a park five years ago and it was truly crazy and trying to like step that up to make it some kind of sustainable proper mm -hmm. festival with amazing headliners is a has been a really difficult but very gratifying gratifying thing and then there's one from much earlier in my career which i really I was really amazed by it was uh, I, I was approached by smirnoff to put on a club event and I, uh, I was really struggling to find anyone of profile to headline this, the 2300 cap arches and the budget was okay and they were like we want a light themed event so I was like okay let's do an aurora borealis themed event so we patched together like I spoke to the tech team and for pretty for like 5k we patched together some aurora borealis effects obviously a ridiculous like uh, try, trying to recreate the aurora borealis for 5k the uh but we done our best and so i but i i booked felix the house cat and the last time he the last two times he had played he had had less than 500 people on a 15 pounds ticket and i repriced it to five pounds so with a bit of support and the northern lights thing we sold 2,300 tickets immediately at a fiver, <laughs> like, uh, and the gross was, the gross ended up being double what it had been on the previous show, and I was like, that is unbelievable. <laughs> the, uh, sometimes, sometimes you, uh, a bit of lateral thinking, reframing what you are 
reframing what you are doing can just change everything you know that leads me into my next question which is probably just as telling um but what's been your biggest failure and what do you learn from it john do you want to start yeah i think um i mean there's there's too many specific show failures but i think i think i definitely it took me a long time to to start to say no mm-hmm. and um you know, for any promoters out there, maybe not in the cities and starting regionally, when an agent rings you, you or, you know, emails or whatever, it's very tempting to say yes. Uh, same for the cities too, but but maybe even more so for the secondary towns because you're getting on a tour and maybe you wouldn't get on before. I spent so many years saying yes when I really should have been saying no. And, and the, 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 you know, in terms of, that's not just in terms of, pushing fees up, that's in terms of taking a show, taking taking another show, feeling that I had to take every single show, feeling that I wouldn't get the calls afterwards if I didn't take those shows. And that led to, that lead, that leads to for you to, that leads to too many shows as well, which means then you're, you're, you're doing too much. And, um, you know, straight away that can affect the profits as well because you just can't cover all the shows. So I think my failures, um, specifically, it was um, a band called Adorable in the 90s who signed to creation. We didn't do advanced tickets. They were, you couldn't buy online then or anything like that. And I oversold the, the venue horrifically. There was like literally 300 people in a 200 capacity room. I couldn't even get in the room. And I was doing security on the monitor desk, on the monitors on the front house and people were coming over top of me into the, into the stage. And the, the, I drunk on the night as well. And the agent, the agent, Mick Griffiths, rung me next day and said, you're blacklisted. I'll never work with you again. Mm. And uh, so that was a specific failure. I now do a lot of shows with Mick. Mm. But that was a yeah. failure in terms of I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I drunk, I drunk alcohol on night, got very drunk. And in mm. terms of finance, I think specifically um, a band called Polyphonic Spree. Years oh, ago. yeah. <laughs> One of my failures, too. Yeah, we're probably on the same floor, <laughs> <Lord. I'm laughs> talking. <laughs> and uh, I booked them into Colchester University, and and I booked them on um, uh, the last day of term. And I didn't really think anything. I never went to university, and I thought this would be great. Everyone last day of term is going to go to this gig. It's a polyphonic spree. It's a very upbeat band. And uh, it was the opposite. Everyone's parents obviously came up. They all went out for dinner, and I lost about thirteen thousand pounds, which was my, of my own money, which was pretty much everything and more, really. That is a lot. Um, Laura, do you want to tell us about your own polyphonic spree failure and, <laughs> and others? Oh, no, I think it was all, I wonder if it was, probably wasn't on the same tour, um, but I just, I'd sort of started working with someone and that had gone very sour. So I'd ended up looking after the show by myself, repping it. I mean, there's 40 of them, but, um, and again, I'd, I'd run out of money. So I was scrambling around to pay the deposit and, just it was a it was a tough gig as a single promoter in Brighton with not much money. Um, and we did, yeah we did it and then mid show the and I uh, I got very drunk as well because I was quite stressed from the whole thing and um, the fire alarms went off mid show and it was all just a bit of a nightmare. But I mean I guess the one one of my early Brighton failures was when um, a lot of people would do sort of warm up shows in Brighton if they had a big you know, festival show or London show, or whatever. So I'd built a relationship and done a couple of shows for a band called Dead Sixties, who, um, you know, I did like three shows for them, and then we'd booked the Concord, which is a five hundred capacity venue for their. I think it was their Glastonbury warm up actually, um, but I hadn't taken out con- cancellation insurance, um, which I didn't really know you had to. It obviously, cost money. It's like a whole another thing so the show the, everyone had loaded in the rider was all in I'd got catering in everything was in and they'd sound checked and they said oh we're gonna have to pull the show because we need to, the singer's losing his voice and he's got Glastonbury to my um so I had to pay everything and that was a huge loss and that was you know the the, the insurance thing is obviously it's sort of six of one and half a dozen of another because obviously if you're paying to insure every show then um, it adds up, but then it does go into the costings, whereas you just sort of have to take it on the chin. They did reschedule, but, you you know, it's, it's still hard to make that money back. Um, 
So, so with the cancellation insurance, Laura, would you now? Would you do you pay? It, would you pay it every I, time? I would. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would pay it. Yeah. Um, and and public liability, more importantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Public liability is not that expensive for what what you get. Like the the cancellation insurance is horrifically horrifically expensive and designed mm. to designed to not pay out. You know, the, uh, it's a uh, yeah. But I ha I have lost uh, six years of not paying cancellation insurance, and uh, like I've I've basically, I've basically lost like one hundred and fifty percent of six years of not paying cancellation insurance on one Neil's Fram show. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Is that, is that your what are your other failures and what did you learn from them, Brian? Was that uh, the big one? Uh, the, uh, the biggest failure that I've uh, that I've had uh, came came during the pandemic, where mm. like the company, the fact we basically just started the company from my spare room and we didn't have our policy documentation together as the company was growing. We didn't. We weren't issuing staff contracts. We weren't issuing docu. We weren't putting out documents, say defining the company's values, defining the conduct that we expect of our employees, and the uh, and that all came to a pretty horrible head last summer. And the uh, so I really recommend. Like it's hard to do. You know, it takes months and months to put this documentation together, and it's expensive to do it, and it costs it costs a lot and like uh but i mean now we've got like human a human resource a human resource company consultant and we've really really worked hard on it samantha's been amazing uh, the to get that stuff in place to make sure that it's, as that we protect our culture as much as we can the uh because we are working with so many people you know we i think we worked with like seven and a half thousand people in 2019 it's like and Often people want us to be responsible for. Often, often people like to make out that we're responsible for their behaviour, for third parties' behaviour. But the if you're if you're watertight as far as your policies are concerned, that you understand the risks of working with other people, and you've got procedures about how to deal with various diff difficult situations, then that's uh, that really really helps. And the uh, I the from a gig point of view like so many mad things have happened over over the years like really crazy ones but what i remember uh, i remember i promoted benny king's last show in scotland and the uh and i just couldn't sell the tickets we were on like 150 tickets it ended up on like two th 230 uh, seated show and i was promoting it and people kept saying to me you mean stand by me benny king and i'm like yeah stand by what other benny king is there of course it's stand by me benny king i was like getting really really angry <laughs> <laughs> and I remember phoning there's like this really popular phone in show on Radio Scotland uh, it's like a football related show it's called Off the Ball and I remember phoning them up and being like hey uh, I said I'm on tour with uh, I texted them and I said I was on, I'm on tour with Benny King and uh, turns out from his days playing with touring with the average white band that he is a massive fan of Dundee United and he's playing, playing at the Archies tonight and the uh, yeah, <laughs> and they read it. They read it. They read it out, and then I, uh, I text them. I text them later. I've been like, and I was pulling your leg. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, did you do that every town? <laughs> Probably the town. <laughs> didn't uh, didn't really didn't really add many sales, but the uh, <laughs> but it was it was a big a big loss. But a bit, but uh, I don't regret it. It was a fun. Uh, it was an amazing night. I even had a drink with Benny King afterwards. That's amazing. Um. Let's look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, so there's one here from uh, Dandara, which says, are promoters still holding back announcements due to uncertainty? I mean, we touched on that a little bit. You'd almost in the opposite, John, some, you were saying you're doing them sooner. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's, I think we're all, we're all slightly different here. And I think you know, some promoters are saying, you know, let's hold on, let's finish it. Let's announce around the record. I kind of, I feel the opposite. I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely feel that it's just better to get the shows out there. Mm. Have it out there, it'll be on ticketing sites, it'll be on your listings, and just start start selling and start giving the tickets down. That, that's how I personally feel. Especially when you don't really know what's around the corner, because last year, you know, there was a window sort of where there was a positivity 
sort of end of summer last year and you know things look good and I think a lot of people who went out then with shows saw a lot of success and then it obviously plummeted and the winter was terrible so you then have to hold off and hold off and hold off and you're getting close to the date so I think while there's positivity and while things are good just in case things take a turn for the worst there's, there's no harm in holding no point in holding back you're also nurturing relationships in a way in another way aren't you because I mean even if those I know from my other side of my job that even if those tours don't happen, people seeing posters, people seeing adverts for a tour is a way of promoting that album, right? And that artist. And therefore people are going to love the fact that you're still supporting that artist, even if the show doesn't happen in a slightly mm. backwards way, right? At this moment. Yeah. I mean, I guess the hard thing is, which the other guys might be able to be more help on is sort of when you, Sort of spend the money on the marketing because you know usually you'd put a lot of money on announcement and then but if you're announcing so far out and you don't know what's happening you kind of where you you know the usual points at which you'd usually put the spend around might not be quite the same as what it used to be yeah for sure you've got to be a little bit more cautious in case things get pushed back and you're looking at a two-year on sale period and and I guess the places that you're advertising must be different because if people aren't going Mm. out in public you're going to be online more right or whatever um phil smith says after being made redundant from my venue manager job i'm helping a new venue get established one of the frustrations is getting responses from agents the feeling is that they have established relationships with national independent promoters and don't feel the need to try untested venues slash promoters particularly if that venue isn't in a primary or secondary market any tips for trying to establish contacts with the agents? Is it just down to persistence? I think it's a new venue. So you need to establish the venue's identity and you need to establish mm. that it's a reliable and excellent place for a show. That means that the artists are treated really well on arrival and then until they leave, that the uh, that the venues that the venue really has its stuff together that it's an easy place it's focused on service it's focused on service and the artist and service and the promoters and servicing the agents and the uh if you're struggling with if you're struggling with uh getting responses from agents then try those try those promoters like mm. make a pitch you know I, I, when i was a venue booker at the arches i remember contacting big duncan at triple g the, the rock promoter and the uh and i was just like you're not using the venue. I'm going to give you three venue hires for free and see how you get on. And he was like, okay, go. Cool. <laughs> so the, so the, he came in, he ran the shows. I proved to him that the venue was excellent, that, it, that, that despite the image thing, that it was like an electronic focused venue, that it worked excellently for, for rock and metal and the, uh, and then the shows kept coming, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, if, I mean, I suppose the question just put yourself in the position of the agents put yourself in the position of the promoters and then try to persuade yourself that the uh to use the venue you know yeah and depending on where it is i mean i think so many venues depend are so avails are so hard to come by that actually you might have a sort of a if you can give a friday or a thursday or friday night at your venue when the competitive venues only got a Monday or Sunday or whatever then I think you know just building the relationship with the promoter to let you know that you've got availability is always quite a, an important thing and what do you sorry we can say John. Uh, I think it's also it is persistence you know agents are very very busy of course and um, but I think you know if you're in that situation and, we, and obviously we don't know where it is that where the venue is but it is you know building your local nights um making sure the venue works and making sure it, the hospitality is good and all of those things too. But I think it, it is a question of persistence and, and making sure you are, you know, not hitting maybe like five agents, you know, try and hit 50 agents. It's a lot of work, a lot of emails. Um, and it's disheartening when you, no one's replying, but I do believe at some point someone will and you'll start to, you start to build a program and particularly now there's less agencies. If you break through with one new agent, you might then break through to another agent in that company quite quickly. So it, unfortunately there is, I don't think there's any real golden, golden rules, but it is persistence, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think like when you're sending, when you're sending emails to people that you don't know, 
if you get them on a good day, they'll reply. And if you get them on a bad day, they won't. It's like mm. the, if if they had been up all night with their kids screaming all night and, and on the the, the 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 night before you decide to email them, the uh, you're unlikely to get a response. You know, it's like it's completely out of your hands. It's not about you. You know. How do you walk that line between being persistent and being just sort of the annoying person in someone's inbox? It's a fine line. It's a very fine line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suppose, that, I, mean I, I, I suppose you just need to graduate at some point yeah like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, I guess you were saying earlier about um growing with with a, agents I suppose it depends who you're talking to at the agency right and maybe if you're a new venue choosing a newer agent would that be yeah I think, I think really, that's really advantageous I heard yesterday um um, but maybe, you know, we're, we're in position, we're hearing of new agents, so it's probably very different to someone who's not having any kind of communication with an agent. Mm. But if you can get into any of the new agents who are just building their rosters, there's more chance that you're going to build something with them. There's more chance they're going to reply because they're maybe not so busy, they're more keen to try different things and establish new contacts as well. I think with the thing with persistency versus um, being that person is is I think you just have to be sensible with it. I mean, it's, you can't email the same agent kind of five days running. I think you email them on a Monday and you make a note, you email them again in four weeks time and, and or whatever, or six weeks time, but you just build up some consistency without being um, aggro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like a face to the name as well, rather than just doing yeah. the inbox the whole time, like finding out what other apps they represent and if their apps in town saying, are you going to be at the so-and-so show at so and so venue can maybe it'd be great to have a drink and just building a relationship that way rather than just being the name in the input box i think it's quite quite important as well absolutely quite, quite right and that's uh that's also the approach like you find a lot of people nowadays who, are, who take very single-minded views of advertising where uh, and you're you're when you're trying to establish relationships you're marketing yourself you know if you only use one method for doing that you're not going to be particularly successful and it's the same way that if you only spend money on facebook ads as a promoter then it's a very one-dimensional view of how people engage how human be human beings engage with marketing and that is not how they do it it's like the facebook is only a small part of that it's like what you try and do is get a message in front of someone six times in six different ways and that's how you uh, that's how they start to build some sort of recognition of what you're doing you know yeah definitely um tom asks how important is the ticket price how do you work to curate ticket prices and the strategy for your gigs i think it's um i think it's an area that um a lot of us don't really know fully I think it's it's that argument when a show sells out, um, maybe you should charge three pound more, and then when it doesn't sell out, oh maybe it's too expensive. Well, we're all a bit blurred around kind of what is the right ticket price, and it's 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 I don't know what the answer is to that. I, I always find it how kind of mad how it is that when you're looking to kind of put an offer on a venue, offering for an actor at a particular venue. You find yourself, you as a promoter, an agent, going to that venue's website and looking what other what other people's ticket prices are and thinking, well, we're on a second album, we're worth this much money. But it's almost like the blind leading the blind because you're just mm. running off, everyone else is doing the same. So it's, it's, it's a really tough question. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the last five years we've seen some of the big tours with, with crazy ticket prices, but then it seems to sell. So... What, what is what is the line? It's 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 really difficult. I don't know if anyone really knows the real answer. We're just kind of kind of shooting in the dark a little bit and kind of gauging the market. And maybe maybe you know this is the other thing which is so ambiguous around it. You'll have one people in a, one person in a queue who say like oh, it's really expensive, and the person behind is on twice as much money, and it's nothing to them as well. So where is that line? You know, it's very hard. Yeah, I always look at the cinema prices as a barometer for what an event might look at and i always think that if you're underselling if you're if your gig is much cheaper than the cheapest cinema price and it's not specifically aimed at young people then the there's something wrong you know the uh, and, but i suppose as an industry for a long time we've just been increasing the prices every year you know it's like the uh, 
the but the tick sales still keep still keep coming and this has helped a lot more people a lot more musicians become professional and the uh so yeah, yeah i kind of like i like i like keeping a premium ticket where possible i don't really think that if you are paying six quid to go and see a show that you can possibly expect anyone to get paid mm. Like I, like I don't. The money's like the, the money's just extremely difficult to manage. Like uh, if you've got three bands playing in a sound engineer and a door person and posters and distribution and Facebook ads and people to put them all together, then that's like uh, that's a huge ask. It's amazing how many people think that that budget should still work. You know. Um. Oh, sorry. We've one more question, but um. Just while you touched on it, how else have you felt your industry changing in the last few years? in that way you said about ticket sales going up every year there been other substantial changes i want i wonder if there's i was having a conversation last night we, we estimate there's 50 promoters in now in london um doing shows and um you know at, at, at a certain level and you start to think about how many acts there are and it's great that the venues are packed again and there are you know we always talk about venues closing down but there's always venues opening up you know that the, the the level of the amount of venues is, is i think is rising in london even though we hear about the more esteemed yeah. ones get closed down i i can't help but think and it's just my view is that we're seeing less bands we're seeing more more acts that can reach a, a certain level in a city so they can reach in london a scala a heaven a village underground which is between you know six and a thousand capacity six hundred and thousand capacity level seeing a lot of acts that can reach that level but then not many funneling through to the next level the next level and i think that's i think that's largely due because there is so much music um, out there we, we're obviously living at a faster pace as well and there's probably there's probably less time to build a career than what there was. Maybe, you know, when you signed years ago, there was maybe labels were thinking, you know, year th album two, album three, year five, year six. So you had time, but now I'm not sure there is that time. So everything's kind of rushed very quickly. And there's this continuous pressure to keep having content out there as well. And so I think that's the major change for me is that is that you you almost need to do more acts to actually get them through the system into a, into a bigger, more co career defining um, um, career really, I think. Or identify the acts with the right teams around them. Yeah. In terms of, you know, who their label is and who Thank their you. manager is and who, and, and sort of rather than doing loads actually just because it, it's so dependent on what the label's doing around the releases and how that's going to, what, you know, if they're going to release just one single or if there's five singles to come and if they're going to keep marketing the album, there's so much that sometimes you'll do a show and it will sell out, the album will come out and then you'll put a bigger show on thinking that it's going to get there and it won't because the label have just taken their foot off the gas because they're on to the next thing. So it's good in, to find out in advance of the shows how, what's, you know, what's going on campaign wise and, I always like to be looped in on sort of press and radio reports just so that you're aware of of what's being talked about and, and what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Nathan asks, how difficult is it to separate the desire and love for an artist or an act as a promoter and then making an offer in, uh, on a band and getting into a competitive bun fight with other promoters? Is there a time to walk away? How do you personally evaluate the risk and weigh up the worth of working with an artist versus your own desire? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, that's extremely that's extremely difficult as i suppose it's like i suppose if you the thing is that identifying your bias is really important not just as a promoter but in, in your whole life you know like uh the we all have bias and the trying to identify it and account for it is like really really difficult but the uh it's 
worth trying. The, uh, you, you, you need to temper yourself when you love the act and you just want to promote them because you might be better just buying a ticket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you have specific examples from your own career? I, I kind I don't focus too much on the I don't focus too much on my failures as far as gigs that I don't get. I get mm. I get well, I'm very thankful for the gigs that I do call and the so yeah, I just need to I just need to keep it in check, you know. So, but of course, sometimes I overpay because I particularly love the act. But I mean, but that that that, that desire that uh, that desire to work with those acts is what keeps us in the industry. That's where the magic is. Otherwise, we could we would we could all be buying and selling some like uh, boring aggregate product or something. Like, I don't know, yeah. like the yeah. like that that is where the magic is, and we are. Like for me, anyway, my business, I'm, I don't think that my taste is better than other people's taste. I just think that that's, that my opinion is my opinion. And that's how, that's how valuable it is. It's not like, it's not a barometer of, of uh, how good something is. And I like to be wrong. The, I think, I think, uh, but the joy, a lot of joy comes from the fact that you're magnetically attracted to these acts and you end up promoting them. And that defines a lot of what you end up promoting. And when you look at it as a whole, you're like, actually, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. yeah. It's hard when, I mean, when I moved from Metropolis, which is an independent promoter, to an, to an AG, um, it's no longer independent, but it was when I was there. Um, and obviously, an AG is not a corporate, but seen as a corporate. The there's obviously promoters as a national promoter. There's no con- there's a tour by tour contract, but not anything else. So it is all down to your relationships. And um, you know, you're always sort of threatened. Well, if you're not going to pay it, then Live Nation will. When you're at a company like AEG, so it's um, there was a lot of you know there were a few acts that I'd worked with since day dot at Metropolis developed and then got to the point where you know I'd moved companies and I was under a lot of pressure to to pay a lot of money um more money than they were worth and I did <laughs> and I lost a lot of money and then haven't actually promoted the act since not because of that but because of something else that happened but it just breaks the relationship as soon as that relation if as soon as you do something you know I, I turned up to the shows and you put on a brave face and like you know it's what well, it's just money it doesn't matter but still the relationships a bit broken because everyone's sort of trying to make something work that's not working um so it is just having the foresight or learning from things like that to know that actually I'm not going to be pushed into something again and um and generally you can identify the the agents that put you under those pressures sure I mean you can you can also analyze the performance of the agents yeah. the, the as far as like is our, our agents consistently giving you acts which are losing cash and I had, I, had a, I had a funny one where one agent I work with uh, he's a dear friend of mine the, <laughs> he, kept, uh, he kept I, I kept losing money on his shows but then whenever he pushed me for a fee a lot of the time I backed off because I really wanted to cut my cloth accordingly and then every time he done that the acts kicked off and I was like <laughs> I just kept having all the I kept having all these acts which were losers. He's like, well, I offered you the winners. I, I was right when I asked for X amount. The uh, that was uh, that was frustrating. <laughs> you have to. Um, there are obviously acts that you you want and you're desperate to get them. And and there's there's that new new thing that goes on. And uh, you sometimes just you have to hold your line and hold the truth to what your company can do. And the problem is, is if you offer X amount of money, then what happens when you pitch again for another new act? So you need to pitch that kind of money again. It's very, we all, I mean, we all love music and you, something comes up and you want to do it, but there's a time um, also, which I'm still, you know, still learning this stuff in terms of there's a time when you just look at the acts that you do promote and go, you know, I, I love these acts and these are, these are the acts I have. But it reminded me of a story, Laura, when you asked the question, because years ago there was the band Carter, the Unstoppable Sex Machine, and they were a big band in the 90s. Mm. And they wanted to come back in the early 2000s because they were two-piece and one of them wanted to get his kitchen done. And they, <laughs> and they, knew, they, were, they knew they were worth a lot of tickets. And Matt Wallacecroft, SJM, is their biggest fan. He loves this band. 
and uh, he knew they were coming back. And uh, he rung me, I was at Live Nation at the time, and he said, obviously, they're my favorite all-time band. I'm really excited about them coming back, but I can't promote them because if it, because if it goes wrong, it's going to kill me forever. <laughs> so, so I did the shows, and we, we did a show here at Brixton and a show at Manchester, and it sold out in a heartbeat. But it was almost that point where it was, they, it was, he couldn't have put himself in that situation as yeah. a fan of that band. I was going to ask, actually, has, has working in this industry altered your relationships with music? Do you, are you still, <laughs> Brian's yeah, nodding furiously. Yeah. Um, is it, are you still as passionate about it? Are, do you, do you, are you doing arithmetic when you, when you watch a band you love? Are you, you know, how has it changed things? Sorry. I mean, it's like I think being away, having the, having the break has been a good thing for everyone because we work at such a pace. But um, I think it's once it's kind of in us, it's kind of in us. And, you know, you hear something on the radio or the Mac plays something this morning I heard and I was like, wow, that's fantastic. And you, you can feel your shoulders and you, you get the shiver for a new act. And I think, I think that's for promoters particularly, even more so than agents, I think. Um, it's, it's kind of there and, and that kind of energy for new music is kind of always, always with us, I think. I uh, I find the pantheon of released music, recorded music, m available now to be completely overwhelming. It's incredible, and the quality of musicians coming coming out now is really astounding. And the number of them, I just it's uh, very very difficult to it's very very difficult to try to to understand everything you know i think this is what i really missed when you watch a live show you get to understand the artist's story you get to understand something about their life you're in their presence and you you just get it you know and this is what i really missed about live because i feel like i don't get it unless i'm in that live environment the uh like I, I'm, I'm not saying i don't like the, i don't like listen to and really enjoy listening to the tunes but it's not the same for me the uh but yeah, I mean, working in music has, of course, it's changed the way we, because of the quantity which we need to listen to as part of our professional roles, that really changes your relationship with it in a very weird way. Mm -hmm. But mostly that's joyous and that's a, that's a privilege, you know? Absolutely. Um, we're at time pretty much now. Um, to summarise... I guess we've talked a lot about relationships, mm -hmm. relationships with agents, with venues, with fans, with other promoters. Um, when to say no. I guess knowing your own uh, limitations sometimes, mm -hmm. fiscal or otherwise. Um, could we just go around very quickly, almost in a line, could each of you give me a golden rule that you, you work by? John. Um, I think I learned very early, very simple things like band loading, always there before band loading. Always, always get the cup, always do your shift and bring the stuff up the stairs or whatever. Always get the tea on and always have the rider laid out before they get to the dressing room. There's nothing worse than when the band are in the dressing room, you're trying to put the rider in place. But uh, they're, they're kind of smaller golden rules. But the thing that always comes back to me is like, you need the right act. You need the right venue, you need the right time and the right ticket. And I mean, that sounds really simplistic, but if you break it each down, if you break it down, you, you can't promote an act if it's, not got, if it's not got something going on. It needs to, it can't be in a huge venue if they've just begun. It can't be a crazy ticket price if they've just begun. And uh, if there's nothing happening or whatever, then you can't do it then neither. So right time, right act, right venue, right ticket. Excellent, thank you. Laura? Um... God, it's hard. I'd say kind of less is more um, and just be quite selective as to what you do and who you work with would be my, in hindsight, <laughs> advice. Um, and yeah, just I, I, I'm a big believer in sort of quality over quantity and doing your best on those sort of shows that you work with. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably it. <laughs> Wonderful. And Brian? Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important to reject the 
very understandable feelings of jealousy that go through the industry. I think it's really negative and really reductive and really damaging for all of us. The uh, the getting to grips with that, controlling anger, control like con controlling stress. If you don't respond positively to difficult situations, you're not going to have a good time in your work. And if you don't have a good time in your work, you're not going to have as good a life. <laughs> Very, uh, it's really important. And also, if you're leading an organization, all of that stuff is like so critical to the way that your staff can have enjoyable lives. And like, if you can't provide for them, then if you can't provide a, a happy environment for people to work in, then you you also need to live there. <laughs> so it's like, it really, really, does help. It really does help everyone, you know. That is wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for, uh, for those who watched and uh, raised questions um, and took part. Thank you to the Association of Independent Promoters to Atom Presents Arts Council England. Um, but most of all, thank you to Laura, John and Brian for being such uh, wise sages. <laughs> and, um, and I hope to see you at a live venue sometime soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank Thanks you. a lot, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.